What's up guys, hope you're having a good day. In this video, we're going to be breaking down all of the main card fights from UFC Fight Night Makachev versus Moises. Hopefully, you're going to be able to use the information in this video to make better betting decisions, put together better DraftKings lineups, and hopefully earn some extra cash. And I hope you enjoyed the extra cash we earned together last week with the recommended bet on Dustin Poirier. If you'd like to see the profit and loss that I made on last week's card, and hear me kind of review each bet that we had, including the Poirier bet, head on over to my YouTube channel because yesterday I dropped this video here where I talk about my results from USC 264. It was one of my biggest winning events of the year so far. Uh, I go over all the kind of bets that I had, the different pre-fight bets, the over-under bets, the prop bets, the live bets, everything. So head on over, you can check out my profitability charts and see how I'm doing. But it was a huge night for me personally. And July is shaping up to be absolutely massive. Now I've got another very, very good value bet in this video. So I'm hoping to keep this winning run going and make July even better than it already is. So stick around for a very, very good value bet coming up in just a little bit. Now, obviously last week, it was a busy week. UFC 264, massive card. They get very, very busy when we have these big pay-per-view cards. A lot of people reach out to me. There's a lot of stuff for me to do. Um, so the, the prop bet video that we did last week wasn't great. This week though, I've got a lot more time available this week. So we'll definitely be able to smash out a prop bet live stream this weekend. So if this video gets 200 likes, I will do a prop bet live stream on Saturday. A couple of hours before UFC Fight Night Makachev versus Moises takes place. So if you'd like a prop bet live stream, please hit the like button below. All we need is 200 likes and we'll get that prop bet video going. Uh, this video is going to receive probably like two to 3,000 views. So it should be very easy to get 200 likes. Hit that like button below for me right now. And let's get this prop bet live stream going. I uh, also want to let you guys know that packs are now on sale for my next box break. So... If you'd like to take part in the box break, all you need to do is go to community and then click the box breaks link. So if you guys don't know, UFC Select is the second ever set produced by Panini of UFC trading cards. The first was UFC Prism, which dropped back in April. And now this is a premium set, UFC Select number two or UFC set number two. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. It releases on the 30th of July. And packs are now on sale. So if you'd like to grab a pack, all you need to do, come to this page and uh, you could buy a pack from here. And of course, I will be opening these packs on stream. Obviously, you guys that watch my channel may have noticed me opening you know, packs of UFC trading cards on stream before. The way it basically works is a video down here you can watch You know, if you'd like to see how it works. But you buy a pack in this box break. Then I open the packs and I send them out to you. Uh, send whatever cards um, you know come out of the packs, and it's just it's a really fun experience. I got into it because you know about 18 months ago I started getting deep into Pokemon cards, and I was kind of buying the box breaks where people would open you know big ticket valuable Pokemon cards, and you could have a chance of you know them opening your pack and pulling something absolutely huge. So that's something you'd be interested in. Check it out. Uh, the select cards in other sports, NFL, NBA, they look absolutely great. They're personally my favorite looking trading cards that Panini produce. And so I'm really, really glad now that the UFC also get their own set of select. And if you don't know a lot about select, come to this page, the Box Breaks page on my site. And learn a little bit about it. Um, because this set hasn't released yet, uh, it drops on 30th of July. I can't actually give an exact date when this Box Break will take place yet. Um, because obviously I don't know how long the boxes are going to take to arrive that I've ordered, but they should be here by the second week of August. And so my plan will be uh, to do the box break the day before the third or fourth UFC event in August. There's two fight night cards uh, towards the end of August. And, and basically as soon as the cards arrive with me, that's when we're going to do the box breaks. So get involved if you're interested in this kind of thing it uh, should be a great set and i'm looking forward to learning about a new set cracking these boxes open seeing if we can get some amazing pulls all right so i think that's about it let's get into the first fight that i want to talk about but actually i suppose it's worth mentioning that this is a particularly difficult fight or difficult card for betting you know if we look at this fight card right there's only 11 fights on this card and out of the 11 fights we've got one two three four five six seven eight nine heavy favorites 
So out of the 11 fights on this card, nine of those fights feature heavy favorites. So realistically, the only way you can usually play these ty types of cards is to scout for good value underdog bets. And I feel we have a great value underdog bet on this card, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but it is a tricky tr tricky card, you know, for betting. And most of these fights are going to be dog or pass because, you know, it's, there's a lot of risk that comes with betting fighters. They're a big favourite in MMA, right? We saw last weekend where Connor broke his leg. A lot of crazy shit can happen in MMA. Fighters can get disqualified. Maybe they get caught with something mental and knocked out. Um, you know, maybe they get, you know, a nasty cut and the doctor stops it. Maybe they get injured. Maybe they have a bad weight cut. Maybe they underperform. Maybe they just suffer from performance anxiety on the night and, you know, they're not feeling it. There's lots of ways fighters can lose. So it's very dangerous to bet big favourites in MMA. And so on this type of card, when I see so many big favourites, I'm mostly scouting for good value underdog bets, which don't always come. So just bear that in mind. It's a tricky card for betting this week. But now, let's get into the first fight that I want to talk about in this video, which is going to be... Daniel Rodriguez versus Preston Parsons. So let's talk about the fight between Daniel Rodriguez and Preston Parsons. So Daniel Rodriguez was originally scheduled to face Abu Bakr Nurmagomedov. Nurmagomedov pulled out of the fight last week and now Preston Parsons is stepping up on about 10 days notice to take on Daniel Rodriguez. So already that's a really, really difficult challenge for Parsons. And, you know, especially against a guy like Daniel Rodriguez that has a great gas tank and can push a high pace for 15 minutes. It's going to be very difficult for Parsons to kind of catch breaks in the fight and pace himself, which, you know, is not what you want on 10 days notice. In terms of the tail of the tape, Rodriguez, 34 years old, 6 foot 1 with a 74 inch reach. Parsons, 26 years old, 5 foot 11 with a 72 inch reach. So nothing major there, but Rodriguez will be a little bit bigger than Parsons. You know, Parsons is on the smaller side for a welterweight. Rodriguez is on the bigger side for a welterweight. Uh, but it will be very, very interesting to see how Parsons obviously looks showing up and fighting on 10 days notice. So what I'm actually going to do as I break this fight down is play some footage for you from Parsons' last fight against Jeff Peterson. So while I'm breaking this down, you can kind of get a look at Parsons. So let's run this in the background. Parsons is the guy in the red gloves. You can see him here. And, oh, so, sorry, first of all, we should probably just, before we get into the footage, take a look at the odds on this one, right? So, Daniel Rodriguez, currently available at average odds of about 1.40, which is minus 250 for an implied probability of 71%. And, again, this is where it gets tricky. If you want to bet Daniel Rodriguez, you've got to give him a more than 71% chance of winning this fight, which, for all the reasons we mentioned earlier on, pretty difficult to do, Um you know, with 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 how many variables there are in MMA, how many how many ways fighters can lose, right? They could get disqualified. They could just suffer from performance anxiety and not feel it on the night. They could get flash KO'd. They could suffer a cut, and a ref, you know the doctor would stop it. Maybe they get injured, like we saw with Connor. It's very very difficult to bet guys in this odds range. The only way you can really do it is if you research a fight and determine that you know what this guy actually has pretty much no way to lose. That's really the only way that you can do it. But anyway, the odds on Parsons are then floating around about an average of, I guess, it's quite a big spread on those odds. We'll call it 3.20, which is plus 220 for an implied probability of 31%. So we pop some footage on in the background. So Parsons is in the red gloves. And for me, he's a very like meat and potatoes type of fighter. He's one of those guys that is just very, very, you know, just very, very average, right? Just a, a regular kind of fighter to me. Um, you know, reasonably good at everything. Not particularly good at anything, if that makes sense. Um, he's got predominantly a, a grappling-based style of fighting. We see Parsons kind of controlling him against the cage here. but uh, Sorry, Peterson controlling him against the cage here. But Parsons is kind of the grappler out of the two. When you go and watch, you know, Parsons past fights, he's very much a wrestle boxer style of fighter in terms of he doesn't carry, you know, that much power in his hands. He's not a particularly effective striker. You can see he's quite flat footed, quite stiff, quite robotic in the way he throws. And really you see it there. His striking is purely just a setup, his grappling, 
punched his way inside there. And as soon as he got his opponent thinking about, you know, thinking about defending himself from strikes, he changes levels, comes in with a takedown. And this really is pass and style. Um, like I say, no real power in his hands. Not a particularly, you know, effective style of striking. You know, he's quite flat-footed. Um, you know, he's not the best defensively. You see him eat a clean, clean left hand there. Um, with this guy, like I say, if the fight stays standing, he's going to struggle really, really bad against Daniel Rodriguez. You know, Rodriguez does definitely have some weaknesses, but he does a good job of fighting long. So it's a reasonably high volume of strikes. He's got a great jab, decent power in the left hand. He's a southpaw, which also makes him a little bit tricky for an average kind of striker, you know, like Parsons. And uh, yeah, man, Daniel Rodriguez, I think, has got just much better footwork, much better movement, much better defensively. He does a good job of fighting long. He should be able to kind of chip away at Parsons from a safe distance. And I don't think 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 that anything that Parsons does is really going to cause Rodriguez too much of a problem standing. Now, this fight gets complicated because remember what we said, Parsons is primarily a grappler. I know we're seeing a lot of striking in this first round, but like I say, if you go and watch a lot more footage on Parsons, you'll see that for the most part, Parsons just looks to use his striking to open up his takedowns and I think the reason why we see a lot of striking from Parsons in this first round is because his opponent is not really you know challenging him standing right he's not really threatening him standing he's not throwing back uh, he's kind of allowing Parsons to tee off on him but what I've noticed about Parsons past fights you know as soon as he eats a big shot standing or as soon as momentum swings in his opponent's favor standing he starts to come forward with a real grappling heavy style of fighting. And of course, we see Peterson with his back against the cage here, just allowing Parsons to tee off. You're not going to get this from Daniel Rodriguez. He's going to be circling away. You know, he's going to be firing back. This is, you know, what point I'm trying to make is Parsons' opponent here, making life very, very easy for him. If we just skip through, though, and we can see this is mostly what you see from Parsons using his striking to open up his grappling. There we can see, you know, Goes to a nice double leg there, ties the uh, the legs up of Peterson, um, you know Khabib style. But Peterson did a pretty good job of scrambling over to the cage and standing back up there. He hesitated. He didn't really commit to standing back up. If we go back a little bit, you can see that here Peterson pretty much stands back up. But then he kind of hesitates, and because of that moment of hesitation, he actually allows Peterson to just take the back there, sneaking sneaking the. Uh, you know, sneaking in this, uh, wait, wait for it, wait for it, here it comes, you're trying to sneak in some hooks, but that hesitation from Peterson is what allowed Parsons to get to the back, had he just stood back up, he would have got back up to his feet quite easily, and this to me, this fight, this little sequence here, and some of the other footage that I've watched on Parsons, you know, you can see there, Peterson has just stood up again, but then chosen to go back down, you know, again, stands back up easily, the, from the grappling that I've seen of Parsons, he does look like one of these guys that is kind of primarily a grappler because his striking's not great. I mean, I know he's having a lot of success with his striking here, but again, Peterson's not really firing back. He's making life very, very easy for Parsons. Usually you see a lot more grappling from Parsons, but I think Parsons is one of these grapplers that chooses to grapple because he's not very good at anything else. So it's his kind of way of stealing rounds and, you know, winning fights and winning rounds against guys who are perhaps not very good at grappling on the regional circuit like this guy Jeff Peterson. And so, most of the time, you know, when you look at Parsons' his grappling, his offensive wrestling's okay. But when he gets guys down, he just doesn't seem to have a very heavy top game. They're able to pop back up to their feet, work their way back up to their feet quite easily. And so, as a result of that, I don't really rate Parsons' his grappling and I also don't think he's going to be able to cause uh, Danny Rodriguez a problem standing either. We'll skip through into the second round. The problem with betting this fight is that Rodriguez is a huge favourite, right? We were saying it earlier on. Rodriguez, 1.40 favourite, minus 250 implied probability of 71%. In order to bet on Danny Rodriguez here, he's got to have pretty much no way to lose. Now... We're getting close to that being the case because Rodriguez has got a good chin. He's got a great gas tank, you know, really good striker. He's got a big advantage over Parsons when it comes to striking. And, you know, he's got that UFC experience. 
Parsons stepping up to take the fight on 10 days notice. Rodriguez has got a bit of a size advantage as well. There are a lot of reasons to like Daniel Rodriguez in this fight. And don't let don't let me uh, you know don't let me you know say things for you you know to to mislead you into thinking that Rodriguez doesn't have a great chance of winning this because he does. My issue with Rodriguez is that we don't know a lot about his grappling. You know, if we look at his past fights in the UFC, Mike Perry was a striker. Nicholas Dalby is primarily a grappler, but he didn't really use his grappling in this fight. It turned out to be a stand-up fight. Uh, Dwight Grant is a striker. Gabe Green is a striker. Tim Means is a striker. Um, Rico Farrington is a striker. And so the problem we've got is Danny Rodriguez has only really fought strikers in his UFC fight so far. So we don't really know anything about his takedown offense and ground game. So while we can look at Parsons and go, you know what, his grappling's not great. Um, it doesn't have a very heavy top game. Struggles to hold guys down. You know, we can say this, but if Rodriguez has got absolutely no takedown offense, he's very, very weak off his back. It doesn't matter that Parsons may not be a very good grappler. You know, he if Rodriguez is a lot worse, Parsons may be able to cause Rodriguez big trouble. Now, it is unlikely. You know, Rodriguez has got 16 pro fights. He trains, you know, uh, uh, you know, he, he's trained alongside Donald Cerrone for a long time, um, you know, but so is Joe Schilling, and Joe Schilling's takedown offense and ground game is appalling, right? So, for me, when I look at this fight, Rodriguez is going to have a huge advantage standing, but it's very, very difficult for me to take him at big favorite odds simply because I just don't know much about his ground game. So that makes me feel very uncomfortable. You know, I like to put my money in strong positions. And, you know, we can assume that with Daniel Rodriguez's level of experience and the guys he's trained with in the past, we can assume he's going to be able to shut down Parsons' offensive wrestling, keep the fight standing and win a kickboxing match. But you know what they say, assumption's the mother of all fuck-ups. And until we see it, uh, we can't, you know, we, we, we can't know for sure what the situation is. So with there not being that much footage available on Rodriguez's takedown offense and ground game, um, I don't feel comfortable betting on Rodriguez as an absolutely huge favorite because I just don't think it gives us a very good risk to reward ratio. On the flip side, I'm not interested in betting on um, Parsons, a big underdog, because chances are Rodriguez will be able to, to keep the fight standing or if he does get taken down will be able to work his way back up to his feet quite easily I would imagine and if it stays standing I think Rodriguez does very well and throw on top of that the reason why I just don't want to bet Parsons is because he's stepping up on 10 days notice which isn't going to be easy against an aggressive um, you know high volume striker like Rodriguez is going to be in his face for 15 minutes so this one's an easy pass for me hope you understand that um, and unfortunately we're going to have to pass on a lot of the fights on this card because they are going to be, you know, similar kind of situations where it's dog or pass, but mainly dog or pass because how big of a favourite the favourite is. And then we've got to make a decision on the underdog. And, you know, I don't just want to set fire to many betting on a bunch of guys who are just not very good. And unfortunately, Parsons fits into that category. So we now move on and talk about Dustin Stolfus versus Rodolfo Vieira. So let's talk about the fight between Rodolfo Vieira and Dustin Stolfus. So I did get a little bit excited when I saw the odds for this fight because obviously Rodolfo Vieira has gassed bad in pretty much every fight that we've seen him in that has gone any amount of time, right? He gassed bad in his last fight against Anthony Hernandez. He was gassing out against Safarov as well. Gassing out against Oscar Bichota. And obviously there is there is an issue with this guy's gas tank. So whenever I see a fighter, you know, like Rodolfo Vieira as a big favourite, it always kind of gets my spidey senses tingling and I always get interested in betting against him because I know most of the time if his opponent can just weather that early storm, they're going to be able to do really, really well in the second half of the fight. And of course, we did bet uh, Sapabek Safarov to beat Rodolfo Vieira. I think Safarov was a huge underdog, uh, which I think he was like a 6.0, 7.0 underdog, which at the time I thought was a great value bet. And it turned out to be correct. I know we didn't win the bet, but Rodolfo Vieira was cut very bad in that fight and had 
Safra have been able to survive another two minutes till the end of the round. The doctor would have been forced to stop the fight. So we almost hit a huge winner there. But based on the fact that I've bet against Rodolfo Vieira in the past, should tell you that I'm not opposed to betting against Vieira on guys that are big underdogs, just because I think that there are a lot of weaknesses that you can exploit in Vieira, and so I'm very open-minded to it. So when I saw the odds on this fight with Dustin Solfus being a really big underdog, got a little bit excited because I thought, great, you know, the bookies have made Vieira a big favourite. Again, he seems to be a big favourite in every fight, despite the fact that he's deeply flawed and has all these weaknesses. And maybe Stolfus is going to be a really good value bet for us this weekend. Um, unfortunately, when I started watching footage on Dustin Stolfus, um, there's not a lot to like about his style. And I'm not sure if this is the dude to bet on against Rodolfo Vieira. So let's go through the odds and I'll try and explain what I mean by that. So current average odds available on Vieira are going to be 1.44, which is minus 227 for an implied probability of 69%. And then if we take a look at the odds on Dustin Stolfus, he's currently around about an average of 2.95, which is going to be plus 195 for an implied probability of 34%. So this fight's roughly 70-30. Uh, in the eyes of the bookies in favour of Vieira. So, obviously, we know what Vieira's style is, right? Very, very high-level Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner. And for a BJJ guy, his offensive wrestling is actually really, really good as well. He's got a great double leg takedown. He's got decent chain wrestling and a very, very heavy top game. So, a lot of these guys that come into the UFC from a base in BJJ often struggle to get fights to the ground. But that's not the case with Vieira. He's already very early in his career at 7-1. And, one, and he, he, he he's definitely got the skills to take most guys down, right? His offensive wrestling is great. And if he gets on top of you, the guy's an absolute nightmare. But even though Vieira has a base in BJJ, we know that he comes out the gate very, very hard. And he commits extremely hard to the takedown. And then he pursues the submission win on the ground you know, very, very aggressively. And so Vieira, in his fights, at least up until this point in his career, has come out sprinting. You know, he hasn't paced himself particularly well. And, you know, the result of this has been he comes out very hard, then kind of slows down and and gasses out and looks real sloppy, actually, after the first round. We saw that against Pichota and against Hernandez. Now, I'm sure that Vieira's gas tank isn't great, but one of the main reasons why this guy slows down is also due to bad pacing because he's sprinting, right? No one, I don't care how good your gas tank is, you can't sprint, right? You, you, you know, you don't see, you know, 100 meter sprinters in the Olympics who are in great shape being able to sprint for 1,000 meters. It's just not possible. You've got to pace yourself, right, and run at a slower pace. With Vieira... You know, it's easy to kind of look at his performances against Pichota and against um, Anthony Hernandez and, and think, you know what? If you can just survive early against this guy, he's going to gas out. I'm not convinced he will gas out because, yes, his gas tank is bad. But the main reason why this guy gasses out is because he sprints. He just doesn't pace himself. He comes out too hard too aggressive and burns through all his energy in round one i think vieira could have a lot more success if he kind of started slower and just just instead of putting everything into trying to get his opponent out of there in round one spread that output from round one across three rounds and if he does that i think he'll perform a lot better because if we look at vieira's record it tells a bit of a story so ignore this loss here and this loss here because they were in uh, they were in grappling matches. If we just focus on his MMA fights, again these were grappling matches, so ignore them. If we just focus on his grappling fights, he's seven. Uh, sorry, his MMA fights. He's seven and one, right? Going into his last fight against Anthony Hernandez, he was seven and zero. Oh. He was undefeated. He'd never tasted a loss before, and so up until the Anthony Hernandez fight. Coming out the gate super hard and looking to get his opponent out of there in round one was working tremendously well for Vieira. And like the old saying goes, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? V 
Vieira was coming out the gate hard in round one, blowing through his opponents, committing super hard to the takedown, causing him big trouble on the ground and winning. So there was no need to change that strategy. And then against Anthony Hernandez, you know, he burnt through all his energy very early in that fight, which means he didn't have as much energy to take Anthony Hernandez down after three, four minutes. And when he did get the takedowns when he was tired, Hernandez was way fresher so he could pop back up to his feet. And then, of course, in the second round, he was so tired that he couldn't get near a takedown. Just didn't have that drive on his takedown entries anymore. And so you look at that and you go, okay, well... The blueprint has been written on how to beat Vieira. Weather the early storm, take him into the second and third round, you'll have a lot of success. But that's an oversimplified way of looking at the sport because we know that to reach the highest level of anything in life, you've got to be very good at learning from your mistakes. And Rodolfo Vieira, very high-level athlete, very high-level Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner, very high-level grappler. Yes, his cardio hasn't looked great in the past. But again, some of that is down to strength and conditioning. The other aspect of it is bad pacing. What I'm kind of thinking about in this matchup is after suffering the first loss of his MMA career against Anthony Hernandez, is he going to go back to the drawing board and think, you know what, I can't afford to pour everything into round one like I have in the past because now I'm facing these high level, higher level guys in the UFC If I don't get that finish in round one, I'm going to be a sitting deck in round two and three and take a lot of damage, right? So with Vieira being a real smart guy, is he going to make an adjustment this weekend? And instead of coming out hard and putting everything into round one, is he going to pace his output and attack over three rounds? And if he does that, he could likely do very, very well against Stolfus. Because if we talk a little bit about what Stolfus brings to the table, his style... The reason why I'm not crazy about betting Stolfus this weekend is because he does have a base in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So we've got an ultra high level uh, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner in Rodolfo Vieira going up a kind of average, you know, an average um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioner in Stolfus. And this guy is not particularly good on the ground, quite weak off his back, quite easy to hold down. And because... He's got a base in BJJ. Even though he should be treating the ground like lava in this matchup against Rodolfo Vieira, he seems quite happy to go to the ground in his past fights. And he seems quite happy to attack off his back with various submissions in his past fights, which would obviously, you'd think, be a death sentence against a grappler as high a level as Vieira. And so, with the style of grappler the Stolfus is, I'm not sure he's going to be able to make Vieira work that hard on the ground. Now, obviously, an area that you can make Vieira work very hard is standing up because he is primarily a grappler, right? If you can keep the fight standing against him, you're likely to have a lot of success. And, of course, one of the reasons why he gassed so bad against Anthony Hernandez is because in that second round, Hernandez went full Nate Diaz, walked him down, put tons of pressure on him and didn't let him off the hook through a very high volume of strikes. There were no breaks in there for Vieira, no no where he could catch his breath. Stolfus doesn't really have that style of striking. Uh, if I'm trying to describe Stolfus, he actually looks and moves standing up like his training partner, Sean Strickland. You know how Strickland's got like that stiff, rigid, flat-footed style? But it works for Strickland. He's very good defensively. You know, He's got a great jab, throws a really diverse range of strikes. That kind of stance, uh, it, it works for Strickland, but it doesn't work as well for Stolfus. Stolfus is more like a bargain basement version of Strickland, where just a very, very low volume striker doesn't really throw that much. When he does throw a single shot, doesn't really have much power in his hands. And so this is significant because Stolfus is a really, really low volume striker. So if the fight does stay standing, he's not going to be able to make Vieira work as hard as guys like Anthony Hernandez that pushed a crazy Nate Nate Diaz style. And he's also not going to be able to trouble you know, Vieira standing like Pichota could because we know Pichota's got big power in his hands. Stolfus doesn't have either of these things. And I'd actually give Vieira the advantage when it comes to striking because his striking is not actually bad. What is impressive about Vieira is even though he's kind of like a, you know, a hyper specialist, you know, uh, one of these guys that just has that base in BJJ. He's striking an offensive wrestling. It, it really isn't that bad. I'm quite impressed by how good he is for, you know, just having eight pro MMA fights. And I guess this, again, speaks to my... Um, speaks to my 
expectation, I guess, that it is quite likely Vieira will show up and pace himself much better on Saturday night against Stolfus because in order to, for him to be as good of a wrestler, as good of a striker he is, he's got to be very good at learning from mistakes. He's got to be a very fast learner. So I'm optimistic for Vieira this weekend, even though I have bet against him in the past and there are big weaknesses there for his opponents to exploit. So this is one of those fights where I look at the odds and I go, I do not want to bet on Vieira as a big favourite because I can't trust his gas tank. I don't want to be betting a guy a big favourite odds that has a questionable gas tank. That's just not smart. You're not getting a good risk to reward ratio there. But I'm also not seeing enough from Stolfus to take him as a big underdog because he's too accepting of being on his back. He has a base in BJJ, which is Vieira's wheelhouse. Um... You know, he's a very low volume striker, not particularly dangerous standing, and he's quite a low volume guy, which means even if Vieira does start to get tired, he might let Vieira off the hook and not make him work hard enough to, to actually, you know, really gas bad to the point where he couldn't defend himself like against Anthony Hernandez. But I do actually still lean Vieira here um, in terms of who I think is more likely to win. But obviously, from a betting point of view, I guess it is dog or pass. Maybe Stolfus shows up and looks a lot better than he has in the past. Maybe Vieira doesn't learn from the mistakes that he made against Hernandez, makes the same mistakes again against Stolfus and finds himself in trouble. Uh, but it's a dog or pass fight for me. I don't want to bet Vieira is a big favourite. Bad risk to reward ratio there. I do also don't want to bet Stolfus a big underdog because he's not seeing me, showing me enough in his past fights to make me think he can cause Vieira a problem. So this one is an easy pass for me. I hope you found that useful. All right, we'll move on to the next one now. I just want to take a quick drink. Okay. So, um, last week when I gave you guys my prediction for the Dustin Poirier versus Conor McGregor fight, of course I recommended everyone bet Poirier. I said before giving you that breakdown that I absolutely hate doing YouTube breakdowns for fights like that because you have a camp of people, uh, you know, that, that think Conor is going to win. And, you know, if you have a different opinion to them, you know, they will abuse you. They will say all kinds of crazy things um, because they just, they, they completely disagree with you and they don't see any way that Poirier could, could possibly win. And then you also have another group of people, you know, Poirier fans, you know, who who, who thinks Poirier is going to win. So if you were to pick Conor McGregor, you get attacked from that side. When you have fights that a lot of people f feel strongly about and a lot of people care about and a lot of people have strong opinions on, someone in my position is in a lose-lose situation because whichever side you go, you're going to take abuse either way. And, you know, I always say that the only place that you find truth and honesty in this industry is in the fight footage, right? The reason why I make so much money betting on MMA, the reasons why all my profitability charts look as good as they do, is because I don't care about what some random guy on YouTube is saying. I don't care what, you know, fighter picks there are, or, you know, what fighters are picking who to win. I don't care about what Ariel Halwani says. I don't care about, you know, I don't care about all this stuff. Because I know 99% of people sharing their opinions in this industry do not do fight research. And I know this because I do do fight research. So when I hear other people talk about fights, I know that they haven't done fight research because they're not telling it like it is. I always say that for me, you know, giving these uh, like breakdown videos to you, they're not opinions, you know, they're not predictions, they're facts. Because... It's kind of like if I open my window and I ask you, you know, what color the, gra the grass is outside, you'd expect everyone to say green, right? For me, betting on MMA is exactly the same thing. If, if you're at a high level, when uh, you know, a high level of doing this, people that watch footage should, should see the same thing, come to the same conclusion, and, you know, it should be a very black and white thing. shouldn't be much opinion in it. Um, Occasionally there will be when you get a really complex fight, but more often than not, everyone should pretty much agree on which fighter has the best risk to reward ratio based on the odds. And we often see this, you know, in our in our live stream research sessions, right? So I don't know if you guys know, I live stream my research for every single UFC fight. 
You can find a link to my Twitch channel in the description below. I live stream all my research on Twitch. And what we often find is when we research these fights together, 90% of people watching the stream at the end of the stream end up all leaning the same way and agreeing. At the beginning, it can often be very split. But by the end of the stream, even people that come in and say, I bet this guy, quite often they'll change their opinion based on things that we find in the stream. And of course, last week, you know, if you go to the YouTube channel, I actually live streamed my research for Poirier uh, McGregor on YouTube instead of Twitch. You can see it uh, here, right? We did a... Th where is it gone? Where is it gone? There we go. Did a three-hour, 20-minute live stream on the uh, Dustin Poirier Conor McGregor fight. Um, where is it gone? Am I going crazy? Where the fuck has it gone? Has it actually disappeared? Oh, there it is with a dodgy thumbnail. It's got the wrong thumbnail. Do apologize, guys. Do apologize. But anyway, we did a fight research live stream. Three hours, 20 minutes on uh, poor E. McGregor. And what was very interesting is by the time we'd finished doing that stream... Every single person agreed that Poirier was the side to be on and Poirier had a good risk to reward ratio. Now, I I didn't think that. So, basically, I'm not really a part of the MMA community. I don't follow any people in the MMA community on Twitter. I don't interact with the MMA community. I don't like to be a part of the MMA community because I find that if you are, it can be quite... Uh, quite damaging. Um, how do I say this? It can be quite. It can be quite difficult to do my job and be a part of the MMA community. So let me give you guys an example. Um, a few years back, going back many many years, maybe four or five years now, I was in a really bad losing streak with betting, and I knew that I had to make changes because I just wasn't performing well. The the way my bets were going were just. You know, I knew that something needed to be needed to be change it, changed. So I started experimenting with like different ways to fix, uh, kind of like this problem, right, and improve my profitability on pre-fight bets. And one of the things that I did initially was I started going on forums, and I, you know, I started going on Sherdog, and you know, I started going on Twitter and interacting in discussions about fights and asking other people questions about fights and you know other asking other you know predictors and stuff and cappers what they thought of fights and blah 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 and I started interacting with the MMA community and I find I found that my performance actually got worse because what happens is if you have a read on a fight and then you go to ask for lots of different people's opinions on that fight you'll get lots of different opinions so what happens is you start to second guess yourself, you start to doubt yourself and you actually feel even less confident because you're not going to get loads of people that agree with your opinion, right? You ask 20 people in the MMA community for their opinion on Conor McGregor versus Dustin Poirier, you get 20 different opinions. So by the time you've talked to all these people, you don't even know where you stand. So for me, I distance myself from everything and I have tunnel vision and I just look at the footage you know pay attention to what the footage is showing me and i don't take anyone else's opinion into consideration because all it will do is lead to self-doubt so this is a really long way of me long-winded way of me saying that i don't really know what guys most people are on or what guys are hyped up and i think to some extent this is why i perform so well and why my profit charts are so great and i make so much money is because I'm completely detached from the herd mentality. So as an example, I play DraftKings, right? And my pick for last week was Irene Aldana. You know, we covered that fight in the breakdown video last week. And I told all you guys, I lean towards Aldana here. I just don't think Kunitskaya is very good. And then I, I, you know, I enter a load of tournaments on DraftKings last week. And I find every single person that I was playing against on DraftKings. Every single person in the head-to-head -head tournaments I was playing on DraftKings had Kunitskaya in your team, in their team. And I was like, why the fuck have you got Kunitskaya in your team? Like, she ain't going to score any points. Like, what are you thinking? That's like the worst pick ever. And then it transpires after the event. I didn't realize, but most cappers, most YouTube predictors and stuff were predicting Kunitskaya to win, which is crazy. Had I been a member of this MMA community, I might have been influenced by herd mentality and changed my pick from Aldana to Kunitskaya, which would have cost me money. 
So, this is a really long-winded way of me saying, we'll get to the point, I'm sorry, but I had no idea that people actually thought Mateos Gamrot is good. And the only way that I know that people think Mateos Gamrot is good is because, obviously, I have a VIP chat room on my website um, where I've obviously got a lot of members in my community. You can see a conversation um you know, a conversation going on here uh, between a couple of members, Paul and Matern, love you boys. Uh, but basically, people in my community do obviously consume other people's content and they do, um, you know, give me some insight into how other people are feeling about certain fighters and certain fights. And so, you know, straight up, I think Jeremy Stevens is one of the best bets of the year. And when I first put this bet out to my community, it was about a week ago now, actually, that we put this bet out. Um, so my members came into the VIP chat room. They were like, oh, my God, I can't believe we're betting so much on Jeremy Stevens when, you know, everyone else is on Gamrot. And I was like, everyone else on Gamrot? Do they have shit in their eyes? Like, are their eyes broken? Like, what are they seeing? This guy is just not good. He has nothing for Stevens. And so I am very much dreading breaking this fight down to you because I know that a lot of you watching this will be on Mateos Gamera. And I guess this is where the value comes from being a member of my website because her mentality, um, you know, is a very dangerous thing. Herd mentality is really, really dangerous and it will mislead you. And I promise you the only way you're going to find honesty in this industry is by watching fight footage and understanding how to interpret the information that you're going to watch in fight footage so just want to put that out there um if you are on gamrot this weekend i'm sure many of you are i would strongly 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 recommend that you put you, you know you you set aside a little bit of time this week before you bet him and take a look at some footage on this guy because i don't think He's anywhere near as good as people think he is. I would recommend checking this guy out. If you're just kind of wiki capping this one or going off what this dude said on YouTube or what that dude said on YouTube, take a closer look at Gamrot. He's probably not as good as you think he is for the reasons that I'll do my best to explain in this video. If you are very interested in this fight, I've got an extremely detailed uh, breakdown video of this fight on my website. If we just run over to my website right now and scroll down, you can see that I've actually got a 1 hour and 12 minute breakdown video on this fight. So if you want to know why I think Stevens is one of the best bets of the year in much more detail than I'll be able to cover here, um, go check out that breakdown video. I go into a lot more depth than I'll be able to here with like clip, you know, short clips of footage and stuff to illustrate points that I'm going to make. We'll go check it out, man. Anyway, let's get into it. There's a lot to talk about with this fight. So, Jeremy Stevens was one of the first names that jumped out at me as a potential bet on this card. Um, my process for researching every fight card is the same. Every Monday morning, I will wake up and I will, you know, pull up that week's fight card and I will go, okay, who are the names jumping out at me as potential bets this week? And then I will prioritize researching those fights first before the odds move too much. And a lot of the time, I'll research fights, you know, that were jumping out at me as potential bets. And while researching, while watching fight footage, I'll be like, you know what? I completely forgot about this. I completely forgot that happened. I completely forgot the fight. this fight has got this weakness. You know, I underestimated how good their opponent was at doing this. And you know what? The odds are probably where they should be. And I'm not going to bet this one. Sometimes I'll research a fight and I'll go, damn, like I read that one completely wrong. After watching footage, I actually like the other dude now. You know, that happens quite often where I'll have kind of like a preconceived idea on how two guys match up stylistically. And I think one fighter is a very good bet. And then I'll do a complete 180 on it and end up leaning towards the other guy and sometimes even betting the other guy. But sometimes when I have an initial lean on a fight and I do think someone could be a great bet... Once I've researched that fight, I will either confirm my initial thoughts or feel even more confident that they're a great bet. And this is one of those situations where I would say I feel even more confident. I could not believe that Jeremy Stevens was an underdog here. It, it completely blew me away. I thought he'd be a big favourite. I thought he'd be like a 1.4, 1.50 favourite here. Um, working from hazy memories and perhaps it's because I've followed Mateos Gamrot's career for a very long time right former KSW lightweight champion 
I'm a huge fan of KSW. I think it's, you know, the most fun promotion in the world to watch. You know, I actually have more fun watching KSW events than I watch UFC events. Yes, you don't get as big a name in KSW, but the quality of the production, the entertainment of the fights they put on, I think KSW is a brilliant promotion. So I've been following Gamrot's career for a very long time and very familiar with him, very familiar with his strengths and weaknesses. And I do think that his record is very misleading. 18-1 and one looks very, very impressive, but fights are fought in the octagon, they're not fought on paper, and his record doesn't really tell us the whole story about the level of skill Gamrot brings to the table. So... Where should we start with this one? Let's start off with the X-Factors, because there are quite a lot of X-Factors to delve into here. So, Jeremy Stevens has had almost 50 pro fights, which means he's got a lot of wear and tear, right? He's also 35 years old, which is no spring chicken for a lightweight fighter. You know, we know that the younger weight classes are young man's divisions, right? 35 years old is quite old for a lightweight, and with almost 50 pro fights on his record as well, we know that Stevens has suffered a lot of injuries in his career, has you know has has taken a lot of damage in his career, and we know that it won't be long before Father Time comes knocking, and it won't be long before Stevens starts to decline. Um, we know Father Time's undefeated; you can't cheat it; it catches up with everyone, and so Stevens will start to decline soon. But what I can there are absolutely no no signs of decline yet. Literally zero. There's just no sign of decline here. And, um, you know, I'm sure it will happen soon. Perhaps it happens this weekend, right? Perhaps Steven shows up and looks like absolute shit Saturday. But I make my betting decisions based on making the best decision right now with all the information I've got available. And to assume Jeremy Stevens is on some kind of a decline is a complete assumption, is complete speculation. Until I see evidence of it, I can't make a betting decision on it. Now, if he shows up on Saturday night looking absolutely terrible against Gamrot, looks a shadow of himself, looks chinny, gasses out, you know, then we've learned in that fight that Stevens is on a decline, right? That's the moment in which he declines. But I can't make decisions based on Stevens being on a decline until he shows us he's on a decline. And I thought he looked absolutely phenomenal against Calvin Cater. Um, you know, you, you talk about what a decline really means. You know, what are the signs that a fighter's on a decline? Well, their gas tank may be, start, may, may be starting to decline. Stevens' gas tank is still brilliant. Their chin may be starting to decline. Stevens' chin, still brilliant. You know, he ate some massive shots from Cater, took a lot of damage from Yaya Rodriguez. He was able to hang in there. Think about other more common signs of a decline. Well, the most common sign of a decline for me, the biggest red flag, is when a fighter's reflexes start to go. And specifically for MMA, the way that you could tell that a fighter's reflexes are starting to go is if... They start to get caught cold with shots they don't see coming in terms of they eat a clean shot and then they react to it after instead of trying to slip it beforehand. And maybe it still lands, but they ride it and rolled with it a little bit. You know, that's the first sign of a decline for me. And offensively, the way that it manifests itself offensively is when you can just see them struggle to pull the trigger, right? Anderson Silva, probably the best example I can think of with this. In Anderson Silva's prime, you give him one tiny little opening, bam, you're dead. He would knock you out. He would see that opening, he would capitalize on it. When fighters' reflexes start to go as they get older, they see the openings, but you can see them kind of hesitate to pull the trigger, and then the end result of that is they usually end up with like a low low volume or lower volume style of striking. Um, Jeremy Stevens isn't showing any signs of those declines. He's still very accurate, still very fast, still hits very hard, still very aggressive, still throws a high volume of strikes. And defensively, he's absolutely brilliant. If you go back and watch his fight against Keita, Keita's one of the best boxers in the featherweight division. Fights long, has a beautiful jab, wide range of strikes, brilliant combinations. He's a great boxer. And yet Stevens was able to see most of the power strikes that Cater threw at him, stay behind that high boxing guard, did a really good job of slipping everything, staying out of trouble. Um, it was just a really, really good performance from Stevens to me. And even though he lost, you know, it was still a really good performance when you consider how good Cater is. And of course, Stevens did win the first round against Cater. Now, you know, when you look at the way the odds are, Jeremy Stevens. You know, we, we did bet him last week when his odds were a lot better than this. But current average odds of about 2.75, which is 
which is plus 175 for an implied probability of 36%. And then if we take a look at the odds on Mateus Gamrot, currently around about an average of 1.44, which is minus 227 for an implied probability of 69%. Those are the odds here. So we have to ask ourselves, why are the odds so off? Like, it's very unusual that the bookies have got the odds this wrong. And it's even more unusual that the betting public haven't corrected them. Because usually when you see odds that are very wacky, they'll get steamed and the public will correct them down and balance some odds out a little bit, right? We're not seeing that so much here. Yes, Stevens' odds have declined a bit, but I think a big part of that was my community moving the odds. Like I say, we bet him last week towards the end of last week and ever since his odds have been declining. But I would have thought Stevens' odds would have got steamed a lot more than this. Like I say, I strongly believe Stevens should be the, the, a pretty big favourite. I think the odds are the wrong way round here. I think Stevens should be about 1.44. But it's very, very unusual that the odds are this inaccurate of course it does happen from time to time five to ten times a year you'll get odds which are just batshit crazy and you'll only really be able to work that out by doing the fight footage and of course we had an example of this very recently when we bet on brandon moreno to beat davis and figueredo we knew that it was absolutely insane that brandon moreno was a 3.0 plus 200 underdog to figueredo but everyone fell in love with the ufc hype machine what people were saying online you know, hurt mentality again, Figueredo's too powerful, blah, 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 all this nonsense. Exactly the same as when Wei Lei Zhang fought Rose Namajunas. Rose never should have been the underdog there. People get carried away with hurt mentality. What I do find a really useful exercise, though, is trying to rationalize why the herd may have had a read on a fight so wrong. And I do think that Jeremy Stevens is lost to Calvin Cater is one of the reasons why the odds are so inaccurate on here. Because most people that are not really that... not really that high level when it comes to being able to interpret a fighter's ability, I believe will unfairly judge Calvin Cater based on what happened in his fight against Max Holloway. Now... It was total domination, right? We'd never seen Max Holloway put a beating like that on anyone before. It was total domination. Max Holloway inflicted a ridiculous amount of damage. Kato couldn't get any success in there. And Holloway completely outclassed him. So I think that based on that performance, people that aren't really close to the sport, people that don't pay close attention to what different fighters' strengths and weaknesses are, I think a lot of people think that Calvin Kate is a bum. I think a lot of people, um, I think a lot of people, sorry about the background noise, guys. I think a lot of people don't rate Calvin Cater that highly, which is a huge mistake because for me, Calvin Cater is one of the best boxers in the division. I think he's a brilliant boxer. But all the stars aligned for Max Holloway that night. That was not only the best performance of Max Holloway's career. But I think it's one of the best performances I've seen in 20 years of watching mixed martial arts. It was a phenomenal performance. It was a masterful performance. It was perfect. And it was one of those things where I don't think anyone at £145 would have beaten Max Holloway that night. It was an incredible performance. And I don't want what Holl what, I don't want the great the great things that Holloway achieved that night to detract away from the level of skill that Cater brings to the table because he's a great boxer. And I think what's happening here is because of how much Cater struggled against Holloway, people don't really understand that Cater's one of the best boxers in the division. He's a very good striker. So because Stevens lost to a guy like Cater that most people don't regard that highly anyway, they're assuming that Stevens is even worse. He's a very low-level guy. And of course, he is worse than Cater. But being worse than Cater, there's no shame in that because of how skilled, how technical, how dangerous Cater is. So I think that first of all, that's one of the, the, the main reasons why the odds are so inaccurate here. Cater getting destroyed by Holloway is misleading people um, because they see a loss to Cater as being a real big red flag when actually, because I rate Cater extremely highly... I don't really hold that loss against Stevens that much because, in actual fact, Stevens looked pretty good against Cater, which speaks volumes because of how better of a striker Cater is than Mateus Gamrot. Obviously, another reason why I think the odds are so off here is because we know a lot of people make their decisions based on win and loss records. We call it wiki capping, right? Where people don't really understand the sport that much. They don't consider how two guys match up from a stylistic point of view. They focus very much on results on paper 
and they make their decisions based on win loss records and you know i don't i can say i can understand why people do this you know last weekend at usc 264 it was painful for me listening to max kellerman and stephen a smith because they don't actually say anything all they say is this guy's on a three fight winning streak and this guy's got nine wins ko and this guy's got three submissions and blah, 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 blah. and they form their opinions based on wins and losses who's beat who who's on this win streak who's got so many wins by this method of victory but they don't actually talk about technique. They don't actually talk about skills. And they don't talk about how two athletes match up against each other. And this is why 99% of you know the, the, the prediction content you find for MMA, you know, 99% of these YouTube prediction channels are a complete waste of time. Because when I watch these videos, all I hear is, well, so-and-so, so-and-so is coming into this fight on the back of a three-fight winning streak and an impressive knockout over ba 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 and so-and-so, so-and-so is on a two-fight losing streak and he just got knocked out, so ba 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 I think this guy is going to win. It's horseshit. It doesn't mean absolutely fucking anything. But unfortunately, to research these fights properly and go into a lot of depth takes a fuck-ton of work, a fuck-ton of time, and a fuck-ton of experience, and most people are not prepared to put the time, the effort, the work in. But... There is pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. If you are pulling, willing to put the work in, you can earn a lot of cash because you can stumble across absolute gems like Jeremy Stevens this weekend at big underdog odds. Now, I'm not saying Stevens is going to win this weekend. Anything can happen, right? He could break a leg. He could suffer from crippling performance anxiety and not perform well. He could have a bad weight cut. He could get caught with a flash KO. There's a bunch of reasons why Stevens may not perform that well this weekend and get beat. But based on past performances, Jeremy Stevens is one of the best bets you'll see this year for the reasons I'll explain when we get into breaking this bite down from a technical point of view. But of course, we know a lot of people make betting decisions based on win-loss records. They wiki-cap fights. And when you look at Jeremy Stevens, he's on a four-fight losing streak. You know, if you go back through Stevens' career, there's a lot of red. There's a lot of red. His record looks very underwhelming, right? He's had 18 losses in his career. And then you look at Mateos Gamrot and you go 18 and 1. Jesus, there's loads of green here. Look at this winning streak. Look at this. Loads of green. Loads and loads of green. And so the human brain is like, oh my God, this guy wins a lot. This guy loses a lot. Well, naturally, this guy's probably going to have a better chance of winning, right? Lots of wins. Lots of losses. You know, clearly this guy is going to struggle. But if you throw Mateus Gamrot in there against Jose Aldo, Zabit Magomed, Sharapov, Yaya Rodriguez and Calvin Keita, he'd be on a four-fight losing streak as well. And trust me, he wouldn't do anywhere near as well of, uh, against those four guys as Stevens did. He would get utterly dominated by these guys because Gamrot is nowhere near the level of any of these four. So the point I'm trying to make is a lot of people will make betting decisions based on win-loss records. But yes, Gamrot's record is impressive. But if he fought the guys that Stevens had fought, his record would look probably even worse than this. So it doesn't make sense to wiki cap. I always say fights aren't fought on paper, they're fought in the octagon. You've got to consider how two guys match up from a stylistic point of view. And Jeremy Stevens matches up extremely well against Mateos Gamrot. So let's talk a little bit about Mateos Gam uh, Gamrot's record because a record of 18 and 1 is very, very impressive. Um, you know. At the end of the day, Gamrot has been competing in a decent promotion. KSW is an excellent promotion. I've watched it for years. And one of the reasons why I really like KSW is because they, they don't protect their fighters, right? You look at Bellator. How long was it before Michael Page faced a fighter that could test him? It was a very, very long time, right? A lot of other promotions protect their golden ponies they protect their poster boys they protect their promotions ksw don't and even though mateos gamrot was the poster boy for ksw in the lightweight division for the longest time mateos gamrot was fighting the best lightweights that ksw had at the time right these were not easy fights for gamrot but what i would say about gamrot is he is the beneficiary of a phenomenon that I have observed over the last 20 years of watching MMA. And it's something that maybe you guys in the United States, you're watching United States, Canada, you may not be able to appreciate this. But basically, you guys in the United States, you know, you do, you do high school wrestling, right? You do wrestling in school from a very young age. In Europe, we don't really have that kind of thing. And so 
if you're a, a, a fighter that has a base in grappling, you, you usually start to learn grappling like later on in your career. Maybe as a kid you did judo or something like that. But for actual things will help you a lot with MMA grappling, like wrestling, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you usually get into that late teens, early 20s, which means you're at a disadvantage against fighters that came up early, you know, wrestling from a very young age. But what is very interesting is because the majority of fighters on the regional circuit in Europe haven't had that grappling training from a young age, they tend to be behind when it comes to grappling. They tend to not have the best takedown defense. They tend to not be the best on the ground. And so what you find is guys that are above average grapplers on the European regional MMA circuit, they can have tons and tons and tons of success. Because the majority of guys they're fighting on the European regional circuit have very little grappling experience and very little grappling ability. So a guy like Mateos Gamrot, who is a reasonable wrestler, like he's okay, his grappling is nothing special. But a guy like Gamrot that does have a little bit of grappling can have tons of success on the regional circuit in Europe because he's facing loads of guys that have no grappling. And that's how he's able to put together a record of 18 and 1. Because Gamrot's got better grappling than the majority of guys on the regional circuit in Europe but when Gamrot then takes that type of grappling to Bellator or to the UFC where he's fighting guys from Brazil, America, Canada whole different ball game and he doesn't then have the level of MMA grappling to compete with these guys on the regional circuit in Europe he's an absolute monster facing guys who have been wrestling their whole lives struggle city and we see this a lot, you know we're going to have a similar sort of discussion in a few months when Paddy Pimblett makes his debut in the UFC. I think he's fighting on that Darren Till Derek Brunson card. Paddy Pimblett is exactly the same as Mateos Gamrot. There's so much hype on him right now coming into the UFC. But he is exactly the same as Gamrot. He's a very average grappler. Nothing special at all. But he's been able to have a decent amount of success in Cage Warriors because he's facing a lot of guys that have no grappling, right? It's like if you take a guy who is a white belt at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, okay? They're a very low level at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because they're only a white belt. But if you put them in a fight or a BJJ match against someone just off the street that's never done BJJ, they're going to absolutely dominate them. They're going to look like a world champion because that tiny little bit of knowledge of BJJ that they've had from three months of training is going to be light years than anything that you know the guy that you pull off the street has got. It's exactly the same phenomenon with guys like Mateos Gamrat and Paddy Pimblett. Against lower level grapplers, they look great. Toss them in there against Jeremy Stevens, who's been wrestling his whole life. All of a sudden, you've got a little bit of problem on your hands because Jeremy Stevens won't roll over and play dead and give up easy takedowns and accept being on his back like the guys will in KSW or Cage Warriors. So we've spoken about, you know, guys that have wrestled their whole life in, in, in America, right? That brings me on to Jeremy Stevens. Look at where he's from. He's from Iowa. And you guys know that Iowa is very, very big on wrestling. It's a big wrestling state. You know, wrestling is embedded within the culture of Iowa. And if we go to Jeremy Stevens' Instagram profile and we scroll down a little bit, we can actually see that here, Jeremy Stevens is wearing an Iowa wrestling t-shirt. Now, this is quite significant because there is something that Jeremy Stevens and his longtime training partner, Dominic Cruz, actually have in common. And the thing that they have in common, well, they have a lot of things in common, but one of the big things they have in common is that they actually have a base in, wait for it, they have a base in wrestling. They started out as wrestlers. Jeremy Stevens is a wrestler at his core. Started out wrestling. So is Dominic Cruz. These guys are both wrestlers. But they started training together a very long time ago at Alliance MMA. Developed a decent level of striking. And then they worked out that they could use their wrestling in reverse to keep the fight on their terms. Standing up, which is where they wanted to be. They could use their wrestling in reverse to stop themselves from being taken down. And built a big career as strikers. There's another very famous guy who did this. You might have heard of him. His name is Chuck Liddell. Chuck Liddell, when we think of Chuck Liddell, we think of devastating knockout artist. We think of, you know, feel a striker. But very, very few guys were ever able to take Chuck Liddell down and hold him down. 
This is because Chuck Liddell started out as a wrestler. Chuck Liddell's base was wrestling. He was a very strong wrestler. Like Stevens and Cruz, he used his wrestling in reverse to keep fights standing on his terms where he knew he'd have a big advantage over his opponent. There's another guy you might have heard of that does this. John Jones, right? Base in wrestling. Very, very high level wrestler. You know, there was even talk of Jones being, you know, taken to the Olympics with the United States if he hadn't have, you know, had a baby at a young age, which kind of disrupted things. But these guys are very smart because they use their wrestling in reverse to keep the fight on their terms, which is significant with this fight. Very, very significant with this fight. I also, I forgot to bring, bring I forgot to go over one X factor early on, just a very, very brief X factor that we need to cover. And of course, this fight is at lightweight, right? Jeremy Stevens over the last few years has been competing at featherweight. So to the untrained eye, People may think that Jeremy Stevens will be smaller here, which may make this an easier fight for Gamera. But I actually think that Jeremy Stevens is likely to be the bigger man going into this matchup. Because even though Jeremy Stevens has been fighting at featherweight over the last few years, if we go back to his record, we can see that he started life as a lightweight. And for many, many years, this guy fought as a lightweight, right? For many, many years. And it wasn't until he had this bad run back in 2011 and 2012 where he lost three fights in a row, albeit against some of the best fighters in the world, Anthony Pettis, Donald Cerrone, and Eves Edwards. It wasn't until Jeremy Stevens lost these three fights that he then dropped down uh, to featherweight and had a decent run winning three fights against Estevan Payan, Honey Jason, and Darren Elkins. But, point I'm trying to make is, Jeremy Stevens is basically a lightweight. And I think he should have fought at lightweight his entire career. Certainly not shame, uh, no shame in losing the three legends of the sport like Eves Edwards, Donald Cerrone and Anthony Pettis. Stevens is a big, powerful, strong, physically imposing fighter. And he used to have to kill himself to make that £145 featherweight limit. I think that the lightweight division is the right division for him. Because we even saw him looking a little bit rough on the scales of his last fight against Drakkar Closer. And what's very interesting to me is even though Drakkar Closer's fought at lightweight in all his UFC fights, at the stare downs for this matchup between Closer and Stevens, Stevens actually looked the bigger man. So yes, Stevens is moving up a weight class here, but I actually expect it to benefit him because he had to kill himself to make 145. I think Stevens is going to be one of these guys that really benefits from moving up back to the weight class that he probably should have been at his entire career. So you just want to get that X factor uh, off the list or ticket off the list, so to speak. So now, now that we've covered all the X factors, which took a little bit of a while there, let's talk about how these guys match up from a stylistic point of view. Well, first of all, if Jeremy Stevens can keep this fight standing, should be a very, very easy fight for him. Gamrot is not a comfortable striker. Uh, he throws a low volume of strikes, no real power in his hands. Yes, I know he knocked out Scott Holtzman, but his fucking cage fighting guys get knockouts and knocked out from time to time. But generally speaking, Gamrot doesn't really have any power in his hands. He's quite an awkward striker, a low volume striker, and just a very, very basic low volume striker, really. There's nothing he does stand in which should really cause Jeremy Stevens a problem. But there are a lot of things that Jeremy Stevens can do standing which are likely to cause Mateos Gamrot a problem so we know Stevens likes to come forward put a lot of pressure on his opponents walk them under the back foot and just try and take them out right with a knockout against the cage that's where this fight becomes very very difficult for Gamrot because his footwork's not particularly good he stands very heavy on his lead leg which leaves him wide open to the very very hard leg kicks that Jeremy Stevens brings to the table and Gamrot's not particularly good at circling away from his opponents which means when Stevens is coming forward and putting pressure on him, Gamrot's going to find it very, very difficult to get out of the way. On top of that, uh, Gamrot's boxing defense is pretty bad, so he's going to be a sitting duck to the knockout power of Jeremy Stevens. Make no mistake, Gamrot is a very, very, you know, he's a, gra he's a grappler, right? His striking only serves to try and set his grappling up, but his striking is actually pretty low level. So standing up, Stevens is going to have a huge advantage here. And I actually think that there's a pretty good chance he knocks Gamrot out this weekend. Um, on top of that, uh, Gamrot is one of these guys that does slow down and become less effective as the fight wears on. And so this is also a problem for Gamrot because when you're forced to work very hard and react to what your opponent is doing, you burn through way more energy because you fight in a state of panic. You can't pace yourself how you want to pace yourself. You can't control your breathing, your heart rate. It's a nightmare. This is one of the reasons we spoke about earlier on why Rodolfo Vieira gassed so bad against Anthony Hernandez. Hernandez did not give 
uh, Rodolfo Vieira any time or space in that fight, so Vieira couldn't catch his breath and pace himself. Gamrot slows as the fight goes on and becomes much less effective as the fight goes on, which is a big problem for him here against Jeremy Stevens because Gamrot is used to people respecting him, right? He was a big name in KSW. Guys showed him a lot of respect. Uh, were very worried about being taken down by him, so they allowed him to dictate the pace of the fight. He's not going to have that luxury with Jeremy Stevens. Stevens is going to come forward, put him on the back foot, and force him to react to what Stevens is doing. Now, Stevens pushes a crazy pace, very high volume striker. Stevens can sprint for 15 minutes, no problem, without getting tired. And that's a huge issue for Gamrot because he doesn't have the power in his hands to back Stevens up. And I don't believe he's got the power in his hands to get respect from Stevens to deter Stevens from coming forward either. So the other option that Gamrot is going to have for slowing down that forward pressure of Stevens is obviously to shoot a takedown, get the fight to the ground. Gamrot is a grappler. He's going to want to get this fight to the ground, make no mistake. But Gamrot is not a very good grappler. Gamrot at times has decent offensive wrestling. But the majority of Gamrot's takedowns come from way too far outside of his opponent's range, which makes it difficult for him to hit takedowns because a guy like Jeremy Stevens is very, very experienced, uh, has that extra bit of time and space to read the takedown entry coming and stuff it before Gamrot even gets near hitting it. And on top of that, one of the main reasons why Gamrot is not a very good grappler is because... For whatever reason, he just doesn't have a very heavy top game. He's reasonably good at hitting takedowns. He's reasonably good at getting guys to the ground. But if you go back and watch footage on Gamrot, he struggles to hold guys down. He just doesn't have a very heavy top game. Doesn't have that physicality to his grappling. So what you usually see with Gam Gamrot, a very high percentage of the time, is Gamrot will hit a takedown, knock his opponent to the ground, and then immediately stand back up to their feet. Gamrot's offensive wrestling's okay. Not the best chain wrestler. Does shoot from way too far outside of his opponent's range, but you know he commits quite hard to, to the takedown, puts a good amount of drive into the takedown, so he will get guys down, but he finds it very difficult to hold them down. Tends to give them a lot of space on the bottom to work their way back up to their feet. So this is another reason why this becomes a very difficult fight for Gamrot, because not only is Jeremy Stevens very difficult to take down, he's also very, very difficult to hold down. And let's take a look at the stats to kind of back this up. Like I say, I've got a much more detailed uh, version of this breakdown on my website that you should check out, where I use like little video clips to illustrate this point. Uh, but the stats can also help you see this point to some extent. So if we go to Jeremy Stevens, okay? Now we've just said that Gamrot doesn't have a heavy top game, not particularly good at holding guys down, shoots from too far outside of his opponent's range, and he's not the most physically imposing grappler, doesn't have very good chain wrestling. Just think think about that, right? Zabit Magomed Sharapov. Okay, Gamrot, 5 foot 10, 70 inch reach. Magomed Sharapov is six foot one with a 73 inch reach, right? He's longer, he's taller. Even though this fight was at 145 pounds, Zabit has a base in combat Sambo, very high level grappler, much bigger than Gamrot. And he's going to have a much easier time of taking Jeremy Stevens down and holding him down than Gamrot will because Zabit is a much higher level grappler than, than Gamrot and he's a bigger guy as well with better chain wrestling. So it's much harder for Stevens to shut down the grappling of Zabit than it is for Stevens to shut down the grappling of someone like Gamrot. But look at how well Jeremy Stevens did it against Zabit. So Zabit shot eight takedowns in this fight and he only hit three of them. Not bad, right? Not bad. Zabit is a significantly better grappler than Gamrot. So if Zabit struggled to get takedowns on Stevens, you would assume that Gamrot would as well. Now, if we go and look at another decent grappler that Stevens has fought, right? If we look at the fight against Moicano. So Moicano, very, very good offensive wrestler. Great, you know, reactive double leg takedowns. We saw Moicano use a grappling heavy game plan against Jay Herbert a few weeks. And Roy Renato Moicano tried to employ a grappling heavy game plan against Jeremy Stevens as well. Similar story though, only hit two of five takedowns. Personally, I believe Moicano is light years ahead of Mateos Gamrot when it comes to grappling. Much better grappler than Mateos Gamrot. So if Moicano could only hit two of five takedowns, chances are Gamrot's going to struggle as well. And then it gets even better. Frankie Edgar. Right, former NCAA Division One level wrestler. Frankie Edgar, former NCAA Division One level wrestler. Can spam takedowns non-stop for 15 minutes, no problem. Never-ending rel relentless gas tank. Uh, heavy top game, great chain wrestling. 
doesn't get much better than Frankie Edgar, right? NCAA Division One level wrestler, guys. Light years ahead of Gamrot. Gamrot shouldn't even put in the same sentence of Edgar when we're talking about grappling. Frankie Edgar only hit 5 of 14 takedowns for 35%. So the point I'm trying to make is Zabit, Moicano and Edgar, who are light years ahead of Gamrot when it comes to grappling, struggle to get Stevens down and hold him down. Therefore, it's reasonable to assume Gamrot will struggle very, very, very badly in this fight. So, I don't really know what else to say about this one. We've gone into a lot of depth. We've covered it in a lot of depth. My point here is, if this fight stays standing, Stevens has a huge advantage. And because Stevens' takedown defense is pretty good, and because Gamrot struggles to hold guys down, and because Stevens does a really good job of working his way back up to his feet when he does get taken down, this is a very, very difficult fight for Mateos Gamrot. The odds are completely wrong on this fight. I think they should be the other way round. I feel very strongly they should be the other way round. All my years of experience, these odds are batshit crazy. Do not listen to a single person that tells you to bet Gamrot this week. If anyone this week whose content you consume, tell you to bet Gamrot or say their lean is Gamrot or their pick is Gamrot. Please, please, please. I don't care if you never watch one of my videos again. I don't care what you think about me. Do yourself a favor. Drop those idiots like a stone because they have no idea what they're talking about. Jeremy Stevens should be the favorite here. And I don't care if he wins. I don't care if he loses. There is absolutely no way that you can cap Gamrot as a favorite here based on past performances because he will struggle extremely bad standing. And based on past performances, he's really going to struggle to get this fight to the ground and keep this fight on the ground. I don't know if Father Time's going to hit Jeremy Stevens hard and he's going to look like shit this weekend. I don't know if he's going to get knocked out. I don't know if he's going to spend tons of time on his back fishing for fucking arm bars and kimuras instead of working his way back up to his feet. But what I do know is based on past performances, which is the only place you'll find truth and honesty in this game, based on past performances, Stevens gives Mateos Gamera absolute fucking hell this weekend. And the fact that he's an underdog is insane to me. So that's all I got to say on this one. That was a long one, man. Let's take a little sip of water before we get into the next fight. Okay. Okay, guys. <clears throat> so. Now let's talk about the fight between Misha Tate and Marion Renault. So if we start off by taking a look at the odds on this one. This is one of the only fights on the card in that even money odds range. Most fights on this card obviously feature heavy favourites. So it's nice that we've kind of got a juicy matchup here. Odds roughly around even money for us to delve into and hopefully find a strong position. So Misha Tate, currently the slight favourite. at odds are about 1.72, which is minus 139 for an implied probability of 58%. And if we take a look at the odds on Marion Renault, she is currently around about an average of 2.15, which is plus 115 for an implied probability of 47%. So these odds roughly in that even money territory. Now, to the naked eye, this looks like a very, very good stylistic matchup for Misha Tate. And to be honest with you, based on past performances, it is a good stylistic matchup for Misha Tate, which is why she is the favourite. Obviously, Marion Renault has a base in Muay Thai and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but her takedown defence is very, very bad. It's pretty easy to get her to the ground. And when she's on the ground, it's very easy to hold her down. Because she has a base in BJJ, she's usually more focused in attacking with submissions off her back instead of working her way back up to her feet, which is a huge issue against someone like Misha Tate, who's built a career from wrestling, right? She's got a base in wrestling. She likes to come forward, tie up with her opponent, get them to the ground, and just beat them up from top position. So to the naked eye, this is a really, really good stylistic matchup for Tate. And I do feel the UFC are kind of gifting, trying to gift Tate a win here. Obviously, Tate is a huge star, a very popular fighter, very marketable, very charismatic. Of course, she looks great. She ticks all the boxes for the UFC. And with, you know, Conor McGregor losing last weekend, the UFC need as much star power as they can get right now. So I do think the UFC have matched Tate up with Marion Renault because it is the perfect stylistic matchup for her. She should be able to take Renault down, control her from top position, and win this fight very, very comfortably. The problem is the X factors complicate this matchup tremendously. First X factor being we haven't seen Misha Tate fight in five years. You know, last time we saw her was against Raquel Pennington, 
And in that fight against Raquel Pennington, even though back then Misha Tate only would have been late 20s, she did show all the signs of a decline. Now, you know, looking back in hindsight, it looks like that decline was down to maybe a lack of motivation because surely after that she retired and went on to have children. But, you know, in that fight, she definitely showed physical decline. You know, usually Tate would be kind of like this stubborn, bullish, relentless wrestler who would drag you to the ground by any means necessary, no matter how much damage she had to take doing it. And she's very, very aggressive on the ground. Against Raquel Pennington, she looked quite physically weak. Looked weak off her back. There was no physicality to her grappling. And uh, just, just looked very, very bad, if I'm honest with you. It was a real big red flag performance from Misha Tate. And of course, since then, now she's gone on to have children. You know, since 2016, she's had two kids. She is now a mum of two children. Um, you know, you can see her here with her kids. And of course, you know, I always say that I need to put a disclaimer out. You know, I'm very happy for Misha Tate. Um, you, know, I, you know, it's amazing that she's had two healthy children. Clearly, she's very happy. And it's incredible that, you know, she's been blessed by having two children. But it is my job to try and make money from predicting the outcome of fights, right? And all I can do is make the best decision possible with the information we have available. Um, I do track some data on, or have been tracking some data on, uh, you know, different X factors in MMA and what that means to the outcome of, of fights. And over the years, I've seen a trend emerge. You know, I've been watching MMA for 20 years. And what I can say to you is fighters that have a child tend to decline significantly after having a child now sometimes they get it back right what i would say is you know after after a female athlete has a child usually what you tend to see is they look very bad in their first couple of fights back and then maybe they never get their athletic performance back or sometimes they're able to kind of, you know, get back in fight shape after a long period of time and they go back to looking how they did before. Some examples of this, Sarah McMahon, um, Sarah McMahon, Alexis Davis, and probably the best example I can think of, Kat Zingano. If you look at the, the those three fighters immediately after having a child, they look very flat, very slow, really lacked athleticism. And then, you know, over two, three, four fight camps, they were able to basically get back to where they were before they had had a child. Um, there are exceptions to the rule. There will always be anomalies. You know, I always say there are six billion people in this world. There are always going to be people that cheat the rules. And there are people that have cheated the rules. Mackenzie Dern, probably the best example I can think of. She had a child and then she came back looking better than ever. Uh, Mackenzie Dern straight back in the mix. But generally speaking, as a general rule... Uh, female fighters that have children take, tend to take a long time to get their athletic performance back. Now, if anyone can get it back, it's going to be Misha Tate. Very high-level fighter, one of the greatest female fighters of all time, former UFC champion, you know, the heart of a lion, incredibly tough. If you had to bet on any fighter being able to defy the odds and coming back and looking better than ever, it would be Misha Tate. But, you know, a wise man once said, crown, check him out on YouTube, the trend is your friend until the end of the trend. And what you don't want to do is be one of these guys that is like, you know, I'm going to bet against the trend because of one time when, you know, the trend didn't play out right. What you don't want to be is the guy that goes, I'm going to ignore the fact that, you know, 90% of the time after female fighters have a baby, they, they their career starts to go downhill. I'm going to ignore that and I'm going to bet on tape based on the fact that Mackenzie Dern was okay. You don't want to be that guy. You want to stick on the side of the trend. What is the most likely outcome? Most likely outcome is tape doesn't perform well this weekend. And, you know, the thing that adds a little bit more weight to that is the fact that she already looked quite bad uh, in her fight against Raquel Pennington. So, interesting times, right? Interesting times. This is a very good stylistic matchup for Tate, but the five-year layoff, the fact that she's had a child, uh, you know, make this a very, very risky one. Now, what I would say is Marion Renault does have a big advantage over Misha Tate's standing. You know, Misha Tate's weakness has always been her stand-up. 
Doesn't really have any power in her hands. Not particularly technical. She's very bad defensively as well. And Marion Renault has got very, very nice Muay Thai. You know, throws a wide range of strikes. She's pretty nasty. She's inv- able to inflict a lot of damage standing. Who could, uh, you know, who could, uh, uh, who could forget all the damage she inflicted on Yana Kunitskaya, right? And incidentally, Yana Kunitskaya is another fighter that struggles to get her opponents to the ground. And so, you know, Marion Renault, based on past performances, will likely struggle here. But Misha Tate, after having a baby, who knows how Misha's going to look this weekend. Obviously, the other X factor that we haven't mentioned is the fact that Marion Renault is one of the oldest fighters in the UFC at 44 years old. And like we were talking about with Jeremy Stevens, you know, father time catches up with everyone. Right, it does. There's no cheating father time. We know the longer or the older the fighter gets, the more likely it is that they will start to decline. And you know, at 44 years old, father time is going to be knocking. Right, Marion Renault will be declining from fight to fight, and we have seen that. You know, she's on a four-fight losing streak. She hasn't looked good in her last four either. This is not like Jeremy Stevens, where he's on a four-fight losing streak because he's performed well against elite opposition and has fallen short. This is a four-fight losing streak against average opponents where Renault did not look good. So, there are a lot of X factors here, which makes this difficult to predict the outcome of this fight. You know, we don't know how Renault is going to look at the age of 44. She should be on a decline. We don't know how Tate's going to look after a five-year layoff after having a baby. We know Renault's probably going to have a big advantage standing. We know Tate's probably going to have an advantage on the ground. But with so many un- intangibles and X factors, we just can't be sure. So for that reason, I would strongly recommend that you pass on this fight. I go dog or pass. I do lean towards Marion Renault just because I'm going to go with the data here. Generally speaking, fighters that have a baby look really, really, really bad in their first fight back after having a baby. That's why my lean is Renault, but not with any amount of confidence. I could see this one going either way. But I would really, really, really love Tate to defy the odds, come back this weekend and look brilliant. Because I think that the bantamweight division is a little bit boring at the moment. I do think it's a little bit light on talent. And Tate is an entertaining fighter, a big personality. She's great for the sport. And uh, she can definitely make that bantamweight division a lot more interesting. So, very happy Tate's coming back this weekend. And hopefully, uh, she pulls a Mackenzie Dern on us and looks better than ever. I wouldn't rule it out. She is still only 34 years old. Okay. Now let's talk about the main event between Islam Makachev and Thiago Moises. So, we take a look at the odds on this fight. Makachev, the biggest favourite on the card at odds of about 1.15, which is minus 667 for an implied probability of 87%. And if we take a look at the odds on Thiago Moises, he's currently around about an average of 5.50, which is plus 250 for an implied probability of 18%. So whenever you get fights, uh, you know, which feature a big favourite, big underdog, you always get asked the question, should Makachev be this big of a favorite you know is it worth taking a gamble on Moises and you know if you throw enough shit at a wall some of it will stick but what I can say to you is I don't care if Moises is plus 450,000 I don't care if he's plus 4 million I'm not betting Moises in this fight because he's going to lose a ridiculously high percentage of the time this is an easy fight for Makachev it's an absolute cakewalk and I would expect him to utterly dominate Moises and win this fight very very easy this is the worst stylistic matchup imaginable for Thiago Moises. Because Moises, you see him in the gi here, he has a base in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He wants the fight to be on the ground. The problem is, Makachev is light years ahead of him on the ground. Moises is a BJJ guy, and don't get me wrong, he's got decent BJJ, but his ground game is just not at the level of Makachev. Makachev, crushing grappling control, dangerous submission grappler, just heavy top game relentless style of grappling he's got that fast style of grappling where he's constantly working constantly moving constantly looking to improve his position the guy is an absolute nightmare i actually think he could be better than khabib because the difference between khabib and makachev is khabib had that crushing heavy style of grappling control whereas makachev has got that but on top of that he's also got that fast grappling where he's constantly hunting for different submissions which means you have to work extremely hard on the ground to defend yourself and that's one of the reasons why this becomes a really difficult fight for tiago moises his gas tank isn't good he does tend to gas as the fight goes on and Makachev pushes such a pace on the ground that I just don't see Moises being able to keep up with the pace that Makachev sets 
on the ground, Makachev is just going to absolutely dominate here. Moises is going to struggle really, really bad. Standing up, Makachev also has the advantage. You know, Moises is a single shot striker, you know, with a base in uh, kicks. You know, he's predominantly kicks based style of striking. Throws single shots, doesn't really have any power in his hands. Makachev's got great footwork, great movement, great distance control. Throws a wide range of strikes. This is Makachev, man. This is like the easiest, shortest breakdown ever. Makachev is significantly better than Moises in every single aspect of MMA. Moises has absolutely no path to victory here. Um, the only way Moises wins is if something crazy happens, which is possible. It's MMA, but I don't like to bet on that. I want to bet on fighters that have a clear path to victory. And there's there's no... There's, the, Moises doesn't have an advantage in this fight. Makachev ticks every box. Makachev has every advantage you could want in this fight. Now, yes, Makachev may get disqualified. Uh, he may get caught with a flash KO. may get caught with a flash submission. Maybe he gets cut bad and there's a doctor stoppage. Maybe he gets injured. Maybe he suffers from performance anxiety. He doesn't perform well. Maybe he has a bad weight cut. But if both guys show up and perform to their full potential, it's a cakewalk for Makachev and he'll dominate. So, very difficult from a betting point of view. For all the reasons I just mentioned, it's dangerous to bet on Makachev because, you know, the chaos of MMA means you're getting a really bad risk-to-reward ratio if you bet him at these odds. But on the flip side, I don't want to bet Moises either because I expect him to get dominated a very, very high percentage of the time. This is just not an interesting bet for me. So I hope you found that useful, guys. Thank you for watching. And uh, yeah, man, if you want that prop bet live stream on Saturday, hit the like button below. Go get your UFC select packs right now. And check out my website, MMABettingTips.com. Link in the description below. We do very well. We crush it every type of bet there is. And I think you'd love being part of our community. So give it a try. Nice one for watching. Take care, guys. Thank you very much. I'll see you in the next one. Have a great weekend, boys. Bye.